Good afternoon. I'm Ian Wardropper, director of the Frick Collections. My pleasure to welcome you to, you to this two-day symposium, Money for the Most Exquisite Things, Bankers and Collecting, from the Medici to the Rockefellers. We knew that this would be a popular topic, uh, but there's been such a surge of interest over the last several days that this morning we decided to film uh, this event, uh, which means that if there's an overflow, people in the garden court can watch it on a monitor. Um, it also means that it'll be available on our website, um, so you can watch it tomorrow if you get up late, um, or if there's one that you want to watch in a month's time, it'll be archived on our website um, as, as long as we get permission from all the speakers, which we hope we will do. Um, and so this will um, help to take care of this overflow crowd today. This is the 11th symposium uh, the Center for the History of Collecting has hosted since its inception in 2007, which is really quite a track record. Uh, and like the others, this program is richly interdisciplinary, inviting all of you to reflect on dozens of motives and methods that led bankers and the leading financiers of their day to collect beautiful art. Fortunately, we have an exceptionally distinguished roster of speakers to guide us in this endeavor, including a historian of banking itself. Although Henry Clay Frick was undeniably a numbers man, no one would ever have classified him either socially or culturally as a financier. Nevertheless, he and his collection had many connections to works amassed and displayed by bankers. We know that he visited the homes of bankers like Pierpont Morgan, in London and New York, the Rothschilds in London and Paris. And when it came time to furnish his 70th Street home, where we are now, um, he, or in the, we're now in the extension of the home that he originally collected for, Frick acquired numerous works from the Morgan estate, the Fragonar panels, much of his French furniture, and virtually all of his Chinese porcelain, Renaissance bronzes, and Limoges enamels. Frick's penchant for Le Gou Rothschild, the special manner of display that the Rothschild dynasty developed, also informed Frick's taste for his office, now the enamels room. Uh, and I think it's notable that he decided to give up his office in order to have a, uh, yet another gallery to display his collection. And finally, one of Frick's closest friends and longtime member of the board of trustees that he established with his bequest was John D. Rockefeller, Jr. This symposium shares with past conferences the objective to expand our understanding of comparatively uncharted waters, and at the same time provide a forum for the exchange of ideas among the growing community of scholars engaged in research on the history of collecting. Indeed, when seen in conjunction with the center's academic and fellowship programs, an assembly such as this can become a springboard for further research that will expand and enrich our knowledge of the history of collecting as a whole. I have every expectation that the presentations you will hear today and tomorrow will stimulate new thinking about the collecting habits of a single category of social animal, the banker financier. I wish to thank the staff of the center, Inga Ries, its director, Edme Kwasbach, and Samantha Deutsch for putting together such an impressive program and roster of speakers. Uh, and particular thanks for generously underwriting the entire event goes to our sponsors, Walter A. Eberstadt, trustee emeritus who has done so much for this institution in so many year, uh, ways for many years, um, and Antonia Weiss who is contributing to this symposium as a tribute to Walter. I will now turn the podium over to Inga Riest who will say a few words and introduce our first speakers, David Allen Brown and Richard Silla, who will frame the issues for this afternoon and tomorrow, Inga. Many thanks, Ian, and let me add my welcome to all of you in the audience and my own special thanks to Walter Eberstadt and Antonio Weiss, not only for making this whole event possible, but in Walter's case for sowing the seed of the idea for the symposium in the first place. More on that in just a minute. 
Uh, beyond expressing my thanks to our, and gratitude to our sponsors, I'd like to begin with heartfelt thanks to my colleagues in the center, as Ian uh, just mentioned too. Um, Esme Quadbach and Samantha Deutsch are both invaluable members of this staff, not only for their contributions in the planning that we do months and months in advance, and uh, trying to define who the speakers should be, and the like, the intellectual content, if you will, uh, but they also leave no detail uh, uncovered when it comes to running the actual event, which today has been a particular challenge. Um, we, as Ian said, we suspected that this topic would have broad appeal, and not surprisingly, our event sold out very early on. So I do beg your indulgence as the ebb and flow of the audience continues throughout this afternoon and tomorrow uh, that you um, help bear with us as we try to make sure that everybody can and get a seat in this auditorium if at all possible. And now a word or two about our program. This really was Walter Everstadt's idea. Uh, several years ago, he came to Anne Poulet and to me to propose that we host a symposium that would investigate whether or not bankers should be viewed as a unique category of collector, one with shared motives that perhaps may not be common to collectors whose interests and fortunes lie in other areas, such as industry merchandising, for example. In our conversations, with, um, which ultimately and most productively expanded to include the center's advisory committee members, we realized that if we were to take on this topic, uh, we should reach back well in time and begin with the Medici and trace the collecting activities of bankers right up to the present day. Most helpfully, David Allen Brown's thoughtful suggestions both in the advisory committee meetings and numerous conversations that he and I had over the telephone brainstorming about the idea led us to conclude that Walter, Walter's idea is indeed a fascinating one and poses a question with no easy answers. And that's why we're here today. Almost every time I've mentioned this topic as the focus of our upcoming symposium to just about anybody, um, I've been given a variation of the same response. You know, well, obviously bankers are art collectors, people would say, because bankers have money and they like to emphasize their social status with a capital S. But just the briefest pause for thought, we realized, uh, will erode such a facile conclusion, um, since uh, we all know that there are plenty of people with ample financial resources, including bankers and financiers, who do not collect art. And I suspect everyone in this room, at one time or another, has been to the home of an affluent friend and found no art whatsoever on the walls, nor sculpture on the pedestals. Um, and conversely, there are passionate collectors whose keen eyes for talent and quality have resulted in the formation of great collections on a shoestring. So it can't just be the money. But this is just the tip of the iceberg for us, and thankfully, David Allen Brown is here with us to further outline the questions and contradictions that we should keep in mind as we hear the 12 presentations of this afternoon and tomorrow. But before I introduce David, uh, Walter himself would like to say a few words to us all. And uh, if you could just all silence your cell phones before we proceed any further, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And here's Walter. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I am not going to be long because the point I want to make is a fairly clear and shortcut one. Mr. Frick did not need to be an art collector to make better steel. Mr. Havemeyer did not have to be an art collector to make better sugar. But bankers, to be better bankers, are very often better bankers because they are art collectors. And in a variety of fields, they've done it all their lives for generations and generations. And they must have had fun doing it. And as I say, I think they really were better bankers because they were art collectors. Think of the enormous opportunities they had 
And last but not least, they made money being art collectors. And with this thought in mind, that they made money being art collectors, I'm going to hand the microphone back to Ian.